Trigger warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. We obey, 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 and this is all done in our own power, and this is all done apart from a dependence on the Holy Spirit, and this is all done apart from the recognition that Christ has indeed purchased that holiness for us, that he has provided the Spirit to apply that holiness to us, that he is the standard of holiness and that he is the example of holiness. And what we wind up doing is just putting our shoulders down, working ourselves to death, and then you wonder why your your people are just unloving, why they are extraordinarily judgmental, why it is that if I were to walk into your church with the blue jeans that I'm wearing right now that have got, you know, holes in the knees, uh, I would get looked at sideways. Somebody might ask me to leave, in fact, um, which I have seen happen in fundamentalist churches, right? You, You got there because you cared more about somebody's opinion than you did about Jesus. And the and the horrible thing to me, Eric, is that the same guys that are doing this are the guys that are abusing little kids. Yeah. Right. So not only are you weighing these people down with an extraordinary burden that they already have a hard time bearing, right? Now you use that as a tool to sneak in the side door and start abusing them physically or sexually or emotionally or mentally. And you use scripture to do it, you absolute piece of garbage. I'm like, what is this is mind boggling to me. And it's amazing how much of it comes back to this. It's amazing how much of it comes back to legalism and Christ not being at the center of this conversation. Right. I think you can trace almost all of it there. You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. To find more information about the Preacher Boys podcast and upcoming documentary, visit PreacherBoysDoc.com or connect on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at PreacherBoysDoc. Now... Here is your host, Eric Skwarzynski. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. I'm so excited to have... um, Let me restart that. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. I'm uh, already messing up and uh, tripping over myself, but it's so good to have Mike Hutchinson on the podcast. He hosts The True Presbyterian. Uh, He came on this show and we did part one of a uh, history and theology of the independent fundamental Baptist movement. And uh, every single week I get a message or a comment on YouTube uh, saying, where's part two? Where's part two? Where's part two? Well, here it is. Um, we're going to dive uh, deeper into the theology side. Last last time we dove really heavy into history. We went from J. Frank Norris up through um, pretty much scratching the tip of uh, Idea Day. And uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and dive into the theology side. Mike, welcome to the show. And uh just give us a quick preview of kind of what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, first, thanks for having me back. Uh, yeah. I appreciate it. Um, I'm sorry about the last interview. I was so sick with the shingles right. that I am still not thrilled with how that interview turned out because I was I was on gabapentin during that interview. So I hope this one's better. Um, <laughs> Only 5,000 people watched it. So Oh, well, there bad. we go. Um <laughs> So when we talk about the theology, the IFB, you and I had talked beforehand, and there were kind of six areas that we we want to talk about. Uh, we're only going to be able to get to three of them, though. So we'll talk a little bit about easy believism. We'll talk some about sanctification. And we're going to start to talk some about the preaching style that you see uh, kind of within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. Um, and uh, I hope that you've got the uh, the video link that I sent you because there's there's some fun stuff in there uh, as far as preaching goes. Um, yeah. But my hope for this is, and, and I want to be really clear about this kind of at the outset, is that what I want to do is offer a, a positive explanation of what we're looking at when we talk about uh, saving faith, and when we talk about sanctification, when we talk about uh, preaching, so that 
look, what happens when you start engaging with, with areas of controversy, like say you write a book on a controversial topic uh, in 10 years, nobody's buying that book. Right. Because it's so bound to the specific moment in time when it was written. And so what I'd rather do is set out a positive explanation so that maybe this continues to help people, you know, in 20 years. Right. Um, and, and I think that makes things a little bit smoother. So. Yeah, no, I think so. And I think the things we're going to talk about are things that are pretty evergreen, you know, and it's things yeah. that have been, um, well, I guess everything in the IFB has been evergreen for several decades. And <laughs> that's one of the, uh, one of the quirks, but yeah, the theology is an important part. And, um, you know, when I started the show, my initial thought was I'm going to avoid theology altogether. You know, I, mm. I didn't want to, um, one, I didn't want to just make myself immediately get shut off by everyone IFB by expressing some of my positions uh, that were different. Sure. Um, you know, so I didn't want to get lost in the the Calvinist thing, just like I don't want to get lost on a, lot, a bunch of preference uh, issues. Um, but the more that I get into the show and the more people I talk to, the more, and this is uh, obvious, you know, uh, from Christian doctrine standpoint, everything's fueled by our theology. And so sure. um, when it comes to the IFB, the, the, much of it is is very very severely fueled uh, for better or for worse by the theology that they have and uh, so i think it is important so if you're listening and you're like why are we turning into a you know theology podcast or why are we are we going to just bash on the theology of the ifb that's not all the intent um, but i think to understand someone's actions you have to understand uh, what's on their mind and what's on their heart um, theologically yeah. speaking yeah. And you can't separate theology from practice. Those two right. things go hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, so what you believe will drive what you do, right. um, which is not to say that there can't be inconsistencies there. Lord knows there are plenty. Um, right. And I'm, I'll happily admit that there are plenty in my own life. Yeah. Uh, but by the same token, theology and practice go hand in hand. And so if you want to talk about the practices in the IFB, you've got to talk about some of the theology as well. So one of the subjects that you wanted to talk about was preaching style. Yeah. And so traditionally the, the division that gets set up is the difference between uh, topical preaching and expository preaching. There's actually a third kind of preaching you, th you could throw in there as well, which is thematic preaching or textual mm -hmm. preaching. Um, and I can talk a little bit about it. Um, but if you want to understand preaching style, we kind of got to narrow in and talk about those things. So, what do we mean when we're talking about topical preaching? So topical preaching is exactly what it sounds like. It's preaching on one particular topic of scripture. Um, and I want to say that good topical preaching actually does exist. Yeah. Uh, so Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a topical preacher. Uh, J.C. Ryle, uh, who would later be the, the Anglican bishop in uh, Glasgow, was a topical preacher and one with extraordinary power. Right. Um, and so good topical preaching is out there. And so when people ask me, you know, how do I feel about topical preaching? Well, my answer is, well, I genuinely don't care as long as you get there exegetically. And that's the core issue when we start talking about topical preaching. Um, and so a good topical sermon, if we're, if we're looking at that, it has a single theme, right? And that theme is just going to pervade that whole sermon from top to bottom. So a good example would be uh, uh, Numbers 32, 23, which is a verse that I know that you like, right? You may be sure that your sin will find you out, right? And so if I were to preach a topical sermon on that, and I was going to be dealing with uh, issues of sin and conviction, then the theme that I would want to pervade that sermon from beginning to end would be something like uh, concealing sin provides the sinner with no security, Right. And so that's going to be my theme that pervades that sermon. And so that would be a really good topical sermon. But then you have a bad topical sermon. Uh, and our example of that is actually taken from a sermon that was preached on Jeremiah uh, chapter five, verse five by John Hamblin. And uh, the, the theme for his sermon, it seemed like to me, uh, and, and I'll, Eric will play this for you. But it seems to me like the theme of the sermon would have been something like go to the giants of the faith for inspiration and instruction. Mm, yeah. Um, so if you want to if you want to play that. Outstanding men are celebrated and commended in every sphere of life, but only rarely are men prolific 
in spiritual areas so recognized. In science, Albert Einstein is supreme. In history, George Washington is a statesman. By the way, if you want to mention his wooden teeth, I guess that's all right, but I'll still major on his war against tyranny. In baseball, Babe Ruth is showcased. In military matters, General George S. Patton is a standard bear. In music, Ludwig van Beethoven is a superstar. And in literature, William Shakespeare is substantial. But when it comes to the notable men of our lifetime who are now in their mansions in glory, it is very fashionable to find fault with their humanity and trash them as though they were garbage. Those individuals who stand out were never sinless, but they stand out nonetheless. Get you under the great men. So that's the, I think that my I think that my summary of his theme would be pretty accurate, right? Yeah. So he reads that text from uh, Jeremiah five five, right? I will get me unto the great men, and I will speak unto them, for they have known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God, but these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Now here's why that's a horrible topical sermon. Uh, as a matter of fact, I texted someone while I was listening to that sermon last night. I was like, I think I might have just stumbled across maybe the single worst sermon I've heard in the last 10 years. Oh, I can find you some better ones. Um, <laughs> and, and that one, I mean, that one is impressively mm-hmm. bad. Um, here's the issue, right? So he's taken the first half of verse five. I will get me unto the great men and I will speak unto them for they have known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God. And he just drops out the last half of that verse. And he builds his whole sermon based on that first half of the verse. Well, here's the problem. It's the great men in the first half of verse five that have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds at the end of verse five. And so if you put this back in its historical context, again, this is, as he mentioned, it's the second sermon that we have here to, um, to, to God's people as they've fallen away. And these are the people that have been through the reforms under Josiah. Um, that's, that's kind of the context. And so earlier in the chapter, he's gone to those that he describes as the simple or the lowly, uh, that sort of thing, and finds that they are apostate. And so his response is, okay, well, I know that this group's not doing well. Let me go to the great men. And the, the Hebrew term there means the men of status, right? So these are men that that are in high places, that they have authority, they've got some sort of position and power. Um, and he says, I'm going to go to them because they have known um, the judgment of their God, and they they have known the way of the Lord. And so these were guys who were involved in Josiah's reforms. And yet their adherence to those reforms was only ever external. It was never truly, vitally, livingly applied to them internally. And so they talked a good game that they were redeemed and that they followed the ways of the Lord and that they were all for the Reformation. And then Josiah died and we found out the truth. Hmm. And I find it ironic that that's the text that John Hamblin chooses to preach on there because who is he thinking of when he speaks of uh, get me unto the great men, right? Those great figures of the faith. Well, he's going to be thinking of somebody like Jack Hiles. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Jack Hiles, that great man of the faith. There's one that's altogether burst the bonds, right? This is a guy that yeah. has that presided over one of the most dangerously abusive churches that we have come across yet, who was sleeping with his secretary for years. Oh, yeah, on the outside, he looked great. But inwardly, there was no reformation. Hmm. Right? So the irony of that is not lost on me. And so when, when you look at that text, that text actually means the exact opposite of the sermon that Hamblin preaches from it. Right. And so that's a horrible topical sermon. And that's what a bad topical sermon does. So what winds up happening when a topical sermon goes wrong is that all too often you have a subject that you want to preach on and you go hunting for a verse to hang the sermon you've already written on. Exactly. Yeah, that's what exactly what I was about to say. 
And so it seems to me, at least, like Hamblin was sitting somewhere and went, I want to preach a sermon about the great men of the faith. Hey, Siri, is there a place in the Bible where the <laughs> word great men is used? And then just went from there. Yeah. And so that's how topical preaching can really kind of go bad. But then you have expository preaching. And in, in one of the things that expository preaching should have in common with topical preaching is that it should have a single uniting theme, right? right? So they, they share that in common, but an expository sermon or expository preaching takes a larger portion of scripture uh, for its text instead of preaching on just a single verse or instead of preaching on a, a half of a verse, like we just heard John Hamblin start to do, uh, it's going to take a whole paragraph or as much as uh, more than one chapter, uh, depending right. on the book and the type of literature that it is. And it's going to produce the sermon from there. And so what it seeks to do is unfold the connection between these verses or paragraphs of scripture, right? So I want, if I'm preaching an expository sermon, I want people to see how, uh, the first paragraph of uh, Mark's gospel, uh, verses 1 through 8, relates to uh, verses 9 through 16, if I'm taking all of those uh, right. as my text. Or I want to show, if I'm just doing verses 1 through 8, I just want to, I want to show how the verses in verses 1 through 8 hang together and what Mark's doing in particular when he quotes from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, and, and how he's drawing on that Old Testament passage to to speak about what the proclamation of the gospel is, mm -hmm. right? So we go to Mark chapter one, verse one through verse eight, we see something like, uh, this is the beginning of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we then move into an explanation of the, the, the prophet. Uh, and that's really what he is, John, the baptizer. Uh, and it says that he is, um, or as it was proclaimed in Isaiah or in the prophet Isaiah, uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. And then it moves straight into the next verse and says in the wilderness, John was baptizing. Right. Well, that's really significant if I'm preaching an expository sermon on that text, because there are at least two things happening there. One, you've got to explain where the phrase in the wilderness goes in the quotation from Isaiah chapter 40, verse three. And there is a long running debate over that. I take that as belonging to the quotation, right? So it's not the voice of one who is in the wilderness crying this particular content. It's the voice of one who is crying, prepare the way of the Lord's and make his path straight in the wilderness. Hmm. Now, why is that significant? Well, because if you go back to Isaiah chapter 40, verse three, what you find is that there is this uh, prophecy that Isaiah has been engaging in and that, he, that he's going to carry all the way through the end of the book of a new exodus. And so just as uh, Yahweh carried the people out of uh, Egypt and led them on the first exodus through the Red Sea and into the land that had been promised to Abraham, their forefather. So the people that have been in captivity in Babylon and Assyria are going to be gathered from the four corners of the earth, from the north and south and the east and west, and that they are going to be led on a new and greater exodus through the wilderness where the paths will be made straight. It won't be like the previous Exodus. This is going to be a glorious Exodus. It's going to be led by a new Moses, who is in fact a greater son of David, and who, according to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, is Yahweh himself, is the one who's leading this Exodus. Well, why is that significant? Well, if you go forward into the intertestamental period, what you discover is that while the Jews themselves returned to the land, they didn't believe that their exile was over. And so if you read the intertestamental literature, that's really clear. And the reason I'm going down this rabbit trail is specific. I'm going to get there in a second. So you guys just, just hang with me for a second. So why is it significant that the very next verse of Mark's uh, opening verses in, in Mark's gospel, the first chapter, starts with uh, John baptizing in the wilderness? Well, in order to get to John, the people of Israel had to cross the Jordan River and go into the wilderness before they could reenter the land. And so what we see happening is John reenacting the conquering of the land. And he says that eventually the one is going to come who is going to baptize you with spirit, right? With the, with the Holy Spirit, right? Again, a new Exodus promise. And so if I'm preaching that text, I'm showing you how all of those verses hang together. And I'm showing you the single through line that appears there. And so the, the theme for that text would be something like uh, Jesus is the promised new Moses and God himself, 
who leads his people on the new exodus that was promised in Isaiah, right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie that text together that way. Um, and expository preaching would normally be connected with what we would call Lectio Continua preaching. And so you're preaching through a whole book of the Bible. And so I'm going to start at Mark 1.1, and I'm going to end at the end of Mark chapter 16. But what I do when I do that is I'm going to trace that theme through the whole book of Mark, because that new Exodus theme is all over it. And so what you're going to see is kind of two things from that. One is you're going to see how the whole book of Mark hangs together. And hopefully if I do this really well, you're going to see how Mark is um, profoundly dependent on the Old Testament prophecies of Isaiah, that this isn't some new thing that just crops up, but this is the fulfillment of thousands of years of prophetic witness. So that's what I'm hoping to do with an expository preaching. Um, and then thematic preaching would be somewhat similar, but what I'm going to do there is follow a theme through all of Scripture, right? So um, say I might follow the covenants, right? So I might follow the covenant of grace made with Adam after the fall and then follow that thread all the way through to the fulfillment of the new covenant in Christ. Or I might show the, significant of, the significance of the exodus and how that is heightened in the Isaiahic prophecies into a new exodus and how that is picked up furthermore in places like Jeremiah and Zechariah uh, and other prophets, and then show how that theme is fulfilled in the New Testament in the person of Christ and how central it is to Paul's letters, for example. That would be thematic preaching. All of these have pros and cons, right? So uh, a topical sermon allows you, topical preaching, allows you to preach through the central doctrines of the Christian faith. And that's a really good thing, right? Because we want people to be acquainted with those central doctrines. And so if I'm doing a series of topical sermons, um, I might decide to do a series of topical sermons on uh, the Lord's Prayer and on the Ten Commandments, right? And that would be perfectly acceptable because that would introduce people to those areas. Or I could do a series of topical sermons on soteriology, and we could talk about justification, sanctification, right. so on and so forth. They can also be tighter and, and in some ways more coherent than an expository sermon is or than expository preaching is. Now, the downside that I've already mentioned is what you can wind up doing is wind up writing a sermon and then go hunting for a passage of the Bible right. to yeah. preach it from. Right. And so I'm, I am admittedly really hard on preachers on this point. Um, and, and, and I admit that, and maybe, maybe that's, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong for some of how hard I am on them for this, but I'm the kind of guy that when I'm sitting in the, when I'm sitting in the auditorium and someone is preaching, like I don't even care if what you have to say is biblical if that text doesn't say it, hmm. right? So everything you have to say could be true. It could be absolutely biblical. It could be perfectly doctrinally sound, but if it's not taught in that text, I don't care. Right. What you, what you can tend to do with topical preaching is what you said, it's hunting a verse. And so what you, what tends to happen um, and, and I, I can say from going to conferences, going to church services, is it would be like, you know, get ready because we're going to be going all over the place tonight. We're going to be flipping here, flipping there. Love the sound of pages rustling. But what you end up doing, even if you have a, a biblical, you know, theme or a biblical, um, you know, a biblical topic, what you end up doing is cherry picking. You go to Strong's Concordance, you find every verse yeah. on leadership, on faithful men, on this. And what you do is you divorce the content from the context. And that's yes. where... That's where topical preaching, most of the time when topical preaching is done, it's done in that way. When yes, you watch most mainstream uh, preachers, when you see uh, the king of this is um, Stephen Furtick. Stephen Furtick does this all yes. the time. Here's my speech. And then here I'm going to pull these verses. And um, right. it's actually, I don't know if I, I don't know if I mentioned this in our, in our last talk, but I think. I think when you get to the conversation about preaching methodology, um, any of those topics, when you come to how you address scripture and preaching, I, I would say that the Stephen Furtick's of the world and the John Hamlin's of the world are two sides of a very similar coin they in are. that they have an agenda and they go and find verses that back that agenda. Even if the agenda is good, they use it to back it and mm -hmm. they end up just reading into the text instead of the text being read for itself and that's the big issue with topical preaching yeah it's uh, it's what chris Bur roseborough calls uh, narcissus right? yes. it's narcissetical yeah. eisegesis 
<laughs> um, yeah. And so the, the, the Bible is about you. And so I'm going to go find a way to read myself into the Bible. And there's another side of that coin between somebody like a, a Furtick um, or like a Perry Noble um, and somebody like a John Hamblin or like a Tony Hudson. And that's the, pol- that's the cult of personality that surrounds them. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my all-time most disturbing thing that I think I've seen in recent memory was the coloring book that yeah. they gave to kids at elevation. Yeah. The that fearless was like, leader or the visionary leader. Yeah. It was like, we follow the visionary leader or whatever it was. And I remember seeing that and being like, that looks like something right out of Maoist China. Right. right? Like that is Jones. terrifying. Yeah. 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 Um, Yes, the Kool Aid is found in the left rear corner of the building. Oh, right. <laughs> right? Um, right. Please dip your cup carefully. Yeah. Um, but then the the others the other piece of that that's really dangerous is is let's say that you that you do topical preaching well, right? And so that you are arriving at your topic exegetically, and that that topic is taught in that particular passage of scripture. The other danger with topical preaching is that you wind up harping on your favorite subjects. Mm-hmm. And so eventually every sermon that you preach turns into why women can't wear pants. Yeah. Right. And so you've got 400 sermons on that. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a, that is a real danger for topical preaching. With the advent of women's um, suffrage, women's liberation, and that type of thing, um, there, I, I'm not a student of that era of history. So there may be things that happened during that time that was right, okay? But that doesn't mean that <laughs> everything that happened during that time that was right, and really it doesn't mean that the way it took place was the correct way for it to happen. A lot of things have happened that ought to have happened that happened the wrong way and then brought about with it many, many uh, consequent evils. Um, we were facetious, but you know it wasn't the women's prayer band who was praying and saying, you know, should we really start wearing pants? That wasn't, that wasn't one of their requests to God for, for, for wisdom on the issue. It was women's liberation. And this was a point of rebellion against God's order. Okay? God's order. Women wanted to be independent of men. And throughout the Bible, that's not the economy that God created us with. And so, but they wanted that independence of man, and they recognized way better than people who, way better than Christians who want to, to make, hang on to this, that pants was, that them wearing pants was a symbol that they were throwing off the authority of men. And that can be offset to some extent by expository preaching. So I'll talk about that for a second. So, right. One of the upsides of expository preaching is it allows the pastor to truly preach the whole counsel of God. And so if I'm taking you through Ephesians from beginning to end, then I'm going to be forced to preach on texts that I'm probably going to be uncomfortable with. So great example of that would be having to preach Ephesians chapter 5. Right. So when we start talking about wives submit unto your husbands as unto the Lord, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, right? That husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, that's actually a really easy text to preach. Right. I mean, let's be clear, right? Nobody is out there running around denying that husbands need to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Uh, that that's, you know, somehow unbiblical. Um, now, Lord knows we've got plenty of problems there in practice. And so a good sermon on husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church is going to delve into those practical areas and what that looks like and say, okay, you know, obviously loving your wife wife as as Christ loves the church means that I'm not going to be abusive towards my wife. It means I'm going to be gentle with my wife. That means that I'm going to be willing to, you know, sacrifice uh, my present for her future in, in some really profound ways, right? But I don't know a single conservative pastor in the conservative reformed world where I, where my circles are, that is going to be comfortable preaching wives submit to your husbands as unto the Lord, right? Because, because you have to undo so much before you can even start preaching that text. Yes. Because my assumption is that I'm going to have people sitting in the audience that come from a fundamentalist background that have heard that text misused and abused. And so I'm going to have to spend 
I'm going to have to spend almost a whole sermon trying to undo all of that yeah. before I can even get into the text itself. Right. And so in its own way, that's just as terrifying, much less if you actually preach that text and preach it in its fullness and, and, and really let the weight of that text go out there and, and kind of hang on people. Then the folks that you know, are, are completely opposed to the sort of godly submission that's spoken of in Ephesians chapter 5 uh, are going to show up outside of your office with pitchforks and torches. <laughs> right. So there's no way to make anyone in the church happy when you preach that text. Right. And let's be clear. Most people, most preachers are, are the kind of people that want other people to like them. Yeah. Right. Like they tend to be friendly and gregarious and they want to be helpful to people. And the idea that there could be a line of people waiting outside your office, you know, like that scene in the movie airplane where the yeah. woman is panicking. <laughs> right. And then this folks shaking her. And then you look behind him and this, you know, a guy standing there with a wrench and another with a baseball bat and a guy in boxing gloves. The idea that that line could be outside your office is not a happy one. No. Yeah. And so that's, that's part of the issue that, that expository preaching will reveal is going to force you to preach on texts that you would not choose to preach on. Right. Right. It's just that that's the way that it's going to be. Now, the downside of expository preaching is that it can turn into a lecture instead yeah. of a sermon. Yeah. Right. So it sounds like you've got some guy up there reading a theology textbook, like you know, Lewis Burkhoff systematic theology. Right. It's like, and that's one of those moments where you're sitting in the audience, you're going like, is this sermon ever going to end? Yeah. Well, and, and you, th that's the danger you run into with the guys who fall into the expository mm -hmm. um, side is, is you, d the other one divorces context of scripture, but a lot of times you can divorce application from scripture and it becomes yes. a history lesson. Yes. And I think that's where um, the, the pastor we had um, back in California did a really good job of being extremely exegetical with his preaching and was very expositional but he right. always gave very solid application that was derived yes. from the text, not applied to the text, which is a, which is a big yes. distinction. Yeah. And, and that's actually the reformation definition of preaching. The reformation's definition of preaching is that preaching is explicatio et applicatio verbum day. It is the explanation and application mm -hmm. of the word of God. And if applicatio, if application is not there, you have not preached yet. Yeah. And so that's what tends to be lacking a lot of times on the expository side. And so that's something that has to be kind of, you have to fight against. Um, and, and I see this as a guy who preaches is that, you know, I'm like the exegetical stuff, my Greek is rock solid. Uh, my Hebrew is pretty terrible, uh, but my Greek's good. And so I can do the exegetical work. I can break the passage down. I can find the central thrust of the text. I can pull out the things that need to be explained. I can do that in a matter of, seven hours, right? That's about seven hours worth of work for me. Um, deriving application from the text is vastly harder yeah. uh, because I need to know who I'm preaching to, mm -hmm. right? So let's say that I get invited to come preach at your church, right? Wherever you're going to church, wherever you are, right? Um, I'm not just going to show up with a sermon that I've preached somewhere else. I don't ever do that. Mm. Um, I'm going to talk to whoever the pastor is that invited me and say, okay, tell me about your church. What's their spiritual spiritual condition? What's their average age? What things do you think that they're dealing with? And so I want to know all of that before I ever start writing my sermon, because I'm not preaching to people in general. Yeah. I'm preaching to the people that are in front of me today. Mm. And so that's actually the danger with radio preachers. Yeah. Um, so guys get on the radio. And if you listen to their sermons, it's like you, you could be preaching to like generic guy in a pickup truck in rural Texas, but nothing you have to say applies to the people that are actually in front of you. Yeah. Um, well, and, and you know that, that you just hit on something that, and you keep going the direction that I'm wanting to want to go with a lot of this is the danger of doing, um, you know, these, these same sermons applied to every situation. I mean, uh, John, yes. Ham John Hamblin literally does the same sermons in every church that he goes to. Um, mm -hmm. the, the danger is, is that you don't have any real, um, one, it might not be helpful for, for anybody, but also too, yeah. when people try to apply a general rule of thumb that you're preaching is like, oh, this is a good standard practice for all of you. Uh, it can have destructive results when you have, you know, something that a married man is going to do as a part of an application might have a very negative connotation when if a single guy did it, yes. it might have an incredible connotation for him. And right. if a woman sitting there 
maybe it doesn't even have an application for her in that same sense. So right. you have to know who you're talking to. And I think most of, I, th- I think that's why most, and we'll probably get back to this cult of personality thing that most sermons at IFB conferences, IFB revival services, even most IFB church services. And again, I say most, there are some actually really good um, preachers in some of these, in oh, some yeah. of these churches. And I say some um, that I've met, but what happens is a lot of times they stick to very basic themes of faithfulness to the church, faithfulness to the ministry, faithfulness to the pastor, to the faithful men in leadership. Right. And that's about the extent of it. Uh, verses 15 and 16, we find uh, that this storm, verse 14, this storm comes out of nowhere. It yep. just it, it just happens in the moment of time. And this ship is now caught in this storm. The Bible describes it as a tempestuous storm. Uh, a, a, temp- a tempestuous wind. It says that the ship was caught and could not bear up under the wind. They ran into an island. This ship was very, excuse me, this might just go on. All right. It was a very strong storm. And mind you, the reason, like I said a minute ago, the reason they are in this storm is because they absolutely disobeyed and ignored the man of God. And I want to say, this isn't the whole message, but I want to say, if you, if you just ignore what the preacher tells you, and I realize the preacher is not God. He doesn't know everything, but he knows more than most of us do. And if you ignore what the man of God says, I promise you, in a moment of time, you're going to find your life in a wreck. I promise you. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to hurt the spirit. But I'm telling you, when you ignore the man of God, nothing good will come from it. Yeah, it might seem good for a little bit. The south wind might blow softly for a couple weeks. But I promise you, somewhere down the line, you're going to find your life in a wreck because you dis- dishonored and you didn't you just ignored the man of God. I promise you it will happen. I've seen it in too many of my friends' lives. I've seen it in too many lives. I promise you when, you, when you don't listen to the man of God, you will find yourself in trouble. And so it's not far-fetched to say that this storm is their fault. And yeah. it, there's no talk of, you know, prioritizing the ministry of your family. There's no talk of, of having personal relationship uh, with Christ and, and a personal uh, study life. Like everything is these practical steps for you to be more involved in their ministry. And that's a, that's a harmful place to be. And what that is, is law light. Right. That's what I call that. And so the, the problem is that that's giving me more things that I can't do. Yeah, right. right. There's more things that I can't do in my own power. Right. And, and, and you don't have, and this pastor doesn't have the, the, the stones to just come out and say, you know, um, Hey, obey me. Yeah. Right. And now I get to be God handing down my commandments um, and you're going to obey me. Instead, he has to couch it in this really soft language of, you know, oh, uh, faithfulness to the church. Right. Well, praise God for people who are faithful to the church. I want people to be faithful to the mission of the church. By the same token, I want to be really clear that their faithfulness to the mission of the church is not faithfulness to me personally. Yeah. Right. So in an ideal world, I get called as a pastor to a church in the middle of nowhere. I preach there for 40 years. I die in 20 years. Nobody remembers my name and the church goes on. Right. That's ideal. Yeah. That's what I want. And so if, if it becomes loyalty to me, then all of a sudden now you've got this weird thing happening where, you know, OK, well, no, my loyalty is to Scripture first. And my loyalty is to the mission of the church as it's given in scripture. And you just happen to be the guy that's here, you know, opening the word and helping us, you know, learn. And, and, and basically you're the chef that's helping prepare these meals for us. Uh, but at the end of the night, you're going to die. Right. And, and as, as my running joke goes is that, you know, they'll carry you out into the you know, church graveyard and, you know, they'll throw dirt in your face and go inside and eat pecan pie and drink sweet tea out of styrofoam cups and they'll forget you. Right. And that's a good thing. Right? That, that's a great thing, in fact, because if they're still talking about me 150 years later, then my fear is going to be that it was because I was preaching myself and not enough Jesus. Right. And that's actually the reason John Calvin wanted his grave to be unmarked. Right. John Calvin didn't want his grave to become a shrine. It, he, he wanted to uh, basically disappear or recede into the background. And so when you've got that sort of weird cult of personality happening and, and you know, you're, you're, you're going from church to church, to church, to church, preaching these same sermons, it, a lot of times what they're doing is, at least in my estimation, they're hiding what they really want to say. Right. Um, and so that's, that's a difficult one.
And two, um, when when it's reliant on the pastor or the minister or the preacher or whatever word you want to throw in there, yeah. Uh, the reality is when they do pass or when they do move, uh, does the person's faith die with that pastor? Does the person's right. faith or 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 walk or whatever word you want to throw there does that pass right. away when the leader passes away? Or does In a the lot church. of cases, yeah. Or does the church? Right. Yeah, I mean that happened at um, Metropolitan Tabernacle. Uh, in London, when Charles Haddon Spurgeon died, uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle very nearly went under. Yeah. Um, because who can replace Charles Haddon Spurgeon? Right. Um, well, no one. But the, the terrifying thing to me is that there were so many people that were there for Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Yeah. Right? How many folks were there because they wanted to see the Lord Jesus Christ exalted? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't perfectly legitimate reasons for moving on from a church. Lord knows that there are. Um, but back to the, the, the problems with expository preaching, one of the other problems that you'll find there is that guys will take on too much. They'll take on too big a chunk of scripture. And then what you wind up with is them preaching like a four, like a Harvard outline, right? So you've got Roman numeral one, A, B, Roman numeral two, so on and so forth. Right. That's the outline that they're preaching from. Well, what you discover is that they're actually preaching three sermons, not one sermon. Yeah. Right. Because they've just taken such a big chunk of scripture that they can't tie the whole thing together. Um, And so that's a danger. And that's again, that's one of those sermons where you're sitting in the room and the guy's been preaching for 10 minutes, but you feel like you've been in the pew for nine days yeah. Right, and this sermon right. just won't end. And how did this happen? It's because he's trying to do too much. Right. Um, and then with thematic preaching, you can have the same thing. Like thematic preaching is great for showing how the Bible is an organic whole. But if you're not really careful, that preaching can turn into a look at how great Jesus is and, uh, you know, just rest in your own brokenness. Right. Well, we saw where that leads with Tully and Chavidjian. Yeah. Right, because that was the kind of preaching that he did. And as you may have guessed by my title, I'm throwing in the towel. Though he joked during a recent sermon about leaving the church, it has become a reality for Pastor Tully and Tavidjan. Tavidjan resigned suddenly Sunday as pastor of Fort Lauderdale's Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. I can't take it anymore. The criticism is too much. The merit mongers win. Tavidjan, the grandson of renowned televangelist Billy Graham, admitted to cheating on his wife of over 20 years after she acknowledged an extramarital affair. Tavidjan released a statement saying, quote, both my wife and I are heartbroken over our actions and we ask you to pray for us. Tavidjan, who clashed with conservative traditionalists at Coral Ridge, narrowly kept his job in a vote six years ago. But thousands of church members have left the congregation down to 2,000 from its heyday. Did, And so, and and of course, that leads into the the larger issues that we see in the fundamentalist world and throughout the Christian church as a whole with sanctification, right? Which is another thing that you and I had planned to talk about. Because all of this stuff flows together. It's kind of like a a really well-made burrito. It's kind of hard to get the cheese off it. Right, right. I think it's kind of a natural progression to the conversation about sanctification. I think we've already, without saying the word, have touched on it a little bit. You know, we've talked about, you know, law light. Um, yeah. If you can, if you can describe it as light, you know, um, you you have a lot of pastors who, as opposed to giving congregants the freedom to to grow and and really, uh, a church should be a place where people should be leaving constantly. And, and I mean that in the sense of if you're preparing people to, to, you know, be, you know, missional, if you're preparing people to, you know, to, to go the directions they need to go, you're probably going to have a lot of people that grow to a point where they end up going and starting their own ministries when they start going and, and leading different directions. Uh, so you're going to have, you're going to have those people that are there all the time, but a lot of pastors, again, applying to everybody, or, or want to stay in a position that makes everybody stay there under their control. And they don't want yeah. to give people the freedom to grow on their own and develop and develop their own standards, their own, um, their own positions on different subjects. They want to superimpose their belief systems onto them. And uh, yeah, oh, sorry, go on. No, no, I, I'm just thinking like that the way that I've kind of described that in the past is in the, it's different in the reformed churches. So the, the, the churches, that are on the European continent, you know, like the Dutch reformed and the German reformed, 
than it is in the Presbyterian churches. Now, Reformed and Presbyterian churches are first cousins. Uh, we have the same theology. We just, for whatever reason, when the Reformed uh, churches moved into Scotland, they got called Presbyterian. Um, so we have a different confession of faith. Uh, in the Presbyterian world, it's the Westminster Confession of Faith and uh, the Westminster Larger and Shorter Catechism. Um, so those are the Westminster Standards. In the Reformed churches on the European continent, it's the three forms of unity, which is the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, and the Canons of the Synod of Dort. Um, but in the Presbyterian churches, all that you need to do to become a member is make a credible profession of faith, right? Um, where in the Reformed churches on the continent, if you become a church member, you actually have to subscribe to confessional documents, uh, just like the minister does. Right. And so that's that means there's a great deal more education that has to happen uh, for that person to become a church member. Um, but it also means that their standards for church membership tend to be tighter. Um, the reason that I point that out is because the idea is, you know, like they want somebody tied to them. It's like, well, or, or, or tied to their particular position at every Have you lost your ever life, loving mind? Right. And so let's take... Uh, Jeff Fugate, for example, right? Is yeah, Am I pronouncing right. his name correctly? Um, I'm not sure. I always say Fugate, but yeah. Right. Okay, I think so that's Fugate, right. Jeff Fugate, that's fine, whatever his name is. Um, just insert your independent fundamental Baptist preacher here, right? They're going to tend to be much more tightly wound on specific questions of subordinate doctrines uh, than is really healthy. As the council culture does its destructive work in our nation I want to say tonight that I'm not going to be a part of those in the cancel culture of fundamental Baptist. I am tonight not ashamed of our, of our heritage. I am not ashamed of our DNA of independent fundamental Baptist. If you want out, get out. And you can find an excuse to let folks know why you got out, but you got out because you're not an independent, fundamental Baptist. That's why you got out. We know it, and you know it. I'm not ashamed of our heritage. Our heritage is Bible preaching from the King James Bible. Our heritage is preaching on heaven sweet and hell hot. Our heritage is preaching against sin and for the holy living of God's people like Christ. I'm not ashamed of our heritage, that soul winning. And I'm not talking about putting a sticker on the bottom of a bottle of water or the back of a loaf of bread. I'm talking about walking up to a man and asking him, sir, do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? And so I want to make a really clear distinction between the person sitting in the pew and the person that's on the session, right? A person that's a ruling elder, right? So if you're sitting in the pew, the only thing I expect you to believe is the Trinity make a credible prof uh, and to make a, a credible profession of faith, right? That you understand the, the depths of your sin, your need for a savior, you're fleeing to Christ and you're relying upon him and him alone for salvation. Um, and I expect you to, uh, to be committed to the peace and purity of the church, right? Those are the membership vows in the Presbyterian church. I expect something entirely different of you if you're a, a member of my session, right? If you're an elder, I expect you to be able to subscribe the Westminster standards, right? So for the person that's in the pew, I don't need to tie you to every point of doctrine that I hold to. Right. But if you're on the session, we need to have very tight agreement around the 33 core doctrines that are found in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Right. And so that's where this law, law, light issue starts coming in, right? Because I, and, and I am admittedly different than some of my friends here. Um, I have really great friends that are out there that, that do not tie themselves as closely to the Westminster standards as I do. Um, I love them. Uh, for many of them, I have great respect for them. They're not for all of them. There's some of them that I think are being sneaky and underhanded. Um, but if we were in a denomination that required strict subscription of the standards, I would have to say to those friends of mine, I love you. I want you to be successful in ministry and the doors over there. Right. Because we have an agreed standard here. Right. But I'm not going to say that to a church member. Right. Right. I'm not going to come to, um, I'm not going to come to Joey who's been a tr Christian for three months and go, okay, I need you to explain to me the ins and outs 
of the two natures of Christ and how, and how those are held together in the one person of Christ. And if you can't get this exactly right, you're out. And of course, I'm not going to do that. And, that. and that's actually a very central doctrine, um, understanding how Christ is both fully human and fully God. Um, but that, again, that brings us into this sort of area. We're talking about cult of personality. We're talking about how these things get hung together. And what falls away in this discussion is the centrality of Scripture and what Scripture demands of us, particularly where it comes to holiness, and the opinions of Pastor Johnny and what Pastor Johnny cares about and what Pastor Johnny says holiness is. And we've got to be really clear that those aren't the same thing, right? Um, so there are things that, for conscience' sake, I don't, per, I don't engage in. There are other things that don't bother my conscience at all. Um, but by the same token, if my friend comes to my house and he doesn't have a conscience problem and he wants to, uh, here's a good example. Let's take alcohol as an example. Bill Reeves, hope you're listening. So let's take alcohol as our example here, right? Um, so Aaron uh, is opposed to people drinking alcohol, right? I don't have a problem with that. Now, if he's, a, in fact, you know, really going to have a major problem with this and we're brothers in Christ, then I'm probably not going to drink around Aaron. No. But I'm also going to be really clear that there is such a thing as a tyranny of the weaker brother. Yeah. Right. And so there's going to come a point where Aaron and I are going to have to conversation, have a conversation and say, brother, I love you, but I'm drinking some bourbon. And if that's a problem for you, we need to work on strengthening your conscience now because I've worked with your weak conscience for some time. Yeah. Um, so we want to we want to thread that needle. Um, but th sanctification is kind of, is kind of central in a lot of this conversation. All right. So I want to, I'll give you a definition of sanctification and this is drawn from our confessional documents, right? So this is the Westminster Shorter Catechism's definition of sanctification, right? Sanctification is a work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness, right? So that's what sanctification is. Right. First, it's a work of God. OK, God does that. Preacher Jeff doesn't do that. Preacher Jeff doesn't sanctify you. God sanctifies you. And so get that clear right up front. Right. The, the other piece of that that we want to make really clear is that this is a matter of free grace. So it's God's grace that's at work, that's in us, that empowers our ability to grow in holiness. It's not a guy standing in the pulpit haranguing you that does that, right? So uh, what is the, the sermon that Bill Reeves preached where he starts to set up Matthew or yeah, whatever right. it is that he starts right. shouting? Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, that's going to help that kid. Wake up, Matthew. Pay attention. If you were riveted on what I was saying, you wouldn't, I wouldn't have to say that. Listen to everything I'm saying, buddy. Look, son. You get an opportunity, a very unique opportunity. You are already a spoiled kid. Your parents don't make you go to school in the district you're supposed to go in. Because you're babied and pampered. Now, t uh, bless God, sit up and s praise God for that. Because you could be being punked out at North Platte High School. And you wouldn't be standing for God there. It wouldn't be easy. I'm just telling you. You still going to Hershey? Oh, where are you going? Oh, that stinks. Shows you I'm up, I'm up on that. So you ruined that opportunity then, huh? <laughs> I'm just telling you. And if you got a good mind, you understand the, the strengths of what they gave you before. If you got a bad mind, then you're just pouring yourself into the world anyway. It's more opportunities to be rebellious. Could you sit still, sir? I mean, aerobics, really, during church? Just calm down, dude. You don't need no medication. You need size 12 right up beside your rear end. Just calm down. It's called self-control. You got any of that? Okay, if you're short on it, they may sell it at Walmart. But you need to purchase some of that before you come to church. It's called self-control. Got bus kids half your age sitting in church doing better than you right now. Just listen. Son, this is for you. The benefits of a family you have no idea about. But I'm sitting back saying after 27 years of marriage, I'm like, I'm glad I made the decision. And you would like it if you had it. Oh, let me tell you, boy, something. You would like it if you had the your original dads. 
and your original mom's together. You'd like it if the family was all still together. You'd like it if everybody was doing right in the sight of the Lord and God was blessing them. You trust me, you'd like your attitude about church would be totally different. Yeah. Um, how about no? Um, and so hey, I'm sorry, I, I reached down. So I thought I had, <laughs> I had the, I thought I had the Westminster uh, confession of faith on my desk. And so I reached down and pulled it up. <laughs> that is not the Westminster confession. I have the Baptist confession. Of faith. No, I, I literally have, I have both and they're nice. like, one's blue, one's red. And yeah. I reached down to pull it up to be like, yeah. And then I was like, that's so funny for of yeah. course, for you of all people. I've got the wrong one up here. Uh, that's so. fine. It's no worries. <laughs> um, so yeah. And, and the other thing that you want to notice is that sanctification is a work, right? It's yeah. not an act. It's not like justification. At the moment of your justification where the Lord calls you to himself and you are uh, receiving and resting upon Christ and him alone for, just, for, for salvation, when you are justified, you are totally justified, mm-hmm. right? It is a pronouncement of not guilty. Yeah. Right. That is an act. That is a forensic act. Sanctification is not an act. When you become a Christian, you don't just overnight become perfectly holy. Though, Lord, I wish that were the case, because uh, that would make my life so much easier, right? And it would it would make being married so much easier if I and my wife were both just perfectly holy. And let me assure you, neither one of us are, right? That that would be great. No, it's a, it's a work. It's distinct from justification. This is something that is a process. It takes a long time. Um, And so we want to make really clear, like God is the author of sanctification, not man. And I think that there is some confusion on that Mm -hmm. in in the Reformed, or pardon me, in the the fundamentalist world. Because I I know that they would affirm that. Like vocally, they would say, well, yeah, of course God is the author of sanctification. Right. Well, if I had nothing but your preaching to go on, would I arrive at that conclusion? Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. It depends on the preacher. Right. Well, it, um, it gets into that conversation of, you know, the gospel being sufficient for salvation, but not being sufficient for sanctification. And that's where the conversation gets lost in in those circles is that um you know, when you get into verses that say, you know, he that began a good work in you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, he begins it and he's the one who empowers you to fulfill. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's what sanctification is. But when you get into fundamentalist camps, you're, you're teaching it's, it's really, it's where you get bogged down in the conversations of, you know, of just sin in general, when you get into Mm -hmm. Baptist churches is they get so tied up on, you know, you know, well, do you, you know, do you renounce that sin? Are you, are you backslidden or are you not, you know, like they get yeah, really yeah. tight on that stuff. And again, like biblically, yes, you can judge someone by their fruit, but also you can't expect there to be, you know, nothing, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Moving, yeah. moving onward. Yeah. And, and, and again, that's, that's one of those areas where that actually leads into kind of part of this is the question of the relationship of law to good works. Right. Right. And so, as we look at someone's life, what are we looking for? We're looking for a trend. Um, I'm looking for a trajectory, right? And so if we think of, of sanctification as kind of a motion upwards, right? Well, an inch isn't much, but an inch is still up, mm-hmm. right? And so I'm not looking for, and, and, and Lord knows, I've, I've actually seen this happen with people. I've seen people become believers and it was just like a light switch went on. Mm-hmm. Um, and and they never never struggled with, sin that had been a major problem with them up to that point. And I've seen other people become Christians and just wage war on sin for years. And you, you know, you you would think that there hadn't been much headway, but then if you stood back and looked, well, no, there was growth happening, but it was slow. And so we want to be really clear that we don't make one man's uh, conversion, the pattern for all, Right. right? Everyone comes and goes through this in a really different way. Um, but when we, when we start talking about sanctification, we necessarily have to talk about the law. We have to talk about works, which means we have to talk about legalism. And these are all problems in the fundamentalist world. And so when we start talking about that things, we kind of have to, we have to find a through line for them that, that at least gives us some hope of 
of kind of arriving, I think maybe at the proper place. Yeah. And I know you've had a previous guest, guest on your show who, who takes a, a different position on sanctification than I do. And so uh, for folks who have listened to that earlier episode, uh, now you're going to get the other side of the coin who, and I who, invite you to examine scripture. Who is uh, that? And it, it was a very early guest where you guys were talking about sanctification and he took much more of a, uh, the law doesn't really have a role in your sanctification. Just name um, him. Who is it? I, I can't remember his name. Okay. I'm like, um, I'm like trying to think through, through. And it so was. It was it, a, it, it, he wasn't an outright antinomian, yeah. but in listening to the, in listening to that episode, I kind of went, Ooh, okay. Uh, yeah. He's definitely on a different team than I am there. Yeah. Um, well, and I, I, I think that's where it, it was tricky when I first started studying. It was, I, I think the default when you, uh, I forget the guy's name, Andy, um, not Andy Stanley, uh, Andy uh, wrote naked gospel Farley, uh, do you know that name? The name, the, the name the of naked, the book is familiar, but yeah, I can't the naked place gospel. The name of the so, so that's kind of the extreme. I think people go to is like where the law has a, no, no role, no right. role whatsoever. Right. You know, religion is a headache, and there's no better example than in the Old Testament, rule upon rule upon rule in the law. And Moses comes down from the mountain. He's got the tablets in his hand, and. The people take the tablets and they read what's on them and then they, they look at everything that's written in the law and they tell God, they tell Him, we're going to do everything written in the book. And you know the story? You know how it went? From then on, we see failure upon failure upon failure. And that's religion for you. And if you fast forward a few thousand years, you end up with Martin Luther coming to the same conclusion, beating himself over his sins, overcome with guilt, lying out in the snow all night long until his colleagues come and drag him to safety, overcome with his own failures, wondering when is enough enough and how am I going to please God and when am I going to get in his good graces and stay there? And that's the story of religion. Anytime anyone takes religion seriously, the same result is always there. Failure. How do we change it? I mean, on this side of the cross as Christians, how do we enjoy a relationship with Jesus without religion? You know, the cross changes everything, but why and how and, and what difference does it really make? That's what we're going to talk about in the Naked Gospel. And I'd like to start having you imagine this story between Moses and, and, and Jesus and this conversation that never took place. But imagine, imagine Moses were to demand something of Jesus, saying, papers, please. And Jesus would have no papers, at least no papers that would qualify him. Because according to the law, Moses said that, that anyone who wanted to serve as a priest, a high priest, a representative to the people spiritually before God, that that person had to be of the tribe of Levi, a Levitical priest. And yet Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, a different tribe, outside of the regulations. Why would God do that? What was his reasoning behind it? God did it on purpose. He did it on purpose to show that if we appeal to Jesus, then we appeal to an outsider. We appeal to a renegade, a table turner, someone who changes the whole system. When there's a change of priesthood, there must also be a change of covenant, the Bible says. And that's the whole point, that if we appeal to God through Jesus, we can't appeal to Him through the law. And you can find all kinds of debate in the Christian world, can't you, about law and grace and shouldn't it be a, a balance between law and grace and shouldn't we compromise between the old way and the new way and find a, a nice mix. But the reality is there's no place for a mix because the regulation says Jesus can't be priest. But we know He's our priest and so therefore because that priesthood has changed, we don't go back to an old system. Jesus and Moses just don't mix. Um, I would say, like, I would say the distinction that I've come to make is, um, I, I would say that that adherence to biblical law is an outflowing of sanctification, as yes. opposed to adherence to the law being the source of sanctification. I think yes. that's and, the distinction between right. legalism and like true sanctification. Right. I, here's here's where I'd go. Right. So first. Yes, God and not man is the author of our growth and holiness. Second, man does cooperate with the Holy Spirit in this. And so it is not simply a matter of, um, you know, oh, I'm just going to rest in my justification. 
and, right. and, and talk about how I'm just a beautiful ruin and how God is doing all of this work to make me more holy. Well, no, you have to do something too. Right. Um, so it's, you know, you, anyway, I'm, well, I, I and, was about to say something there I was going to regret. So I'm going to stop before I do. Well, and um, two, and two, like, th- again, this is where it gets, and this is where it can't be covered in just one, you know, pithy kind of sentence, right. but you, but you are positionally holy. Yes. And, and that's and, justification. Yes. But holy in the sense of being separated, be mm-hmm. holy. Like I'm, that's actually a question I actually asked in a group the other day is, you know, how do you reconcile? Someone had, someone had tweeted something about um, if you don't do this, you cease to be holy. If And in my mind, I was thinking positionally, I'm like, you can't cease to be holy because you're made holy right. through Christ's righteousness. But when right. you look at holy through a term of separation or, yeah. or a term of being, which again, separation has a lot of baggage to it too, as well. Sure, but, especially but when, in the fundamentalist world. Right. But when you get to the term of like, you know, living in accordance with who you are as a new creature, you know right. what I mean? At that point, right. you know, you're talking renewing of your mind. You're talking about doing things that are acting in accordance of your true nature. And just right. like being when you're a sinner, you act in accordance with your sin nature. When you become holy, you act in right. accordance with a holy nature. Right. And and so that's uh, John Murray, who is a professor of New Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, uh, when it began up through the, the 1960s or 70s, uh, wrote a paper on that that was called Definitive Sanctification. And so he made a distinction between someone being positionally holy, right? Like when you become a Christian and you are justified, you really are united to Christ and are holy in that sense. And there's also a progressive aspect of sanctification, Um and this would take us into the weeds a little bit. And so I'm not going to, don't want to get in the weeds, but I would say that I, I agree with him uh, in what he's driving at, but I don't like the language that he used to get yeah. there. Um, but the, the flip side of that is that, so then we have to talk about where the law lays in this, right? So, so what relationship does the law have, right? It, as, as God is the author of our sanctification, how does he use the law if he uses it at all? Mm-hmm. And so I would say he does. Uh, and I think that we, we need to be really clear about, about what the role of the law is um, when we're talking about, you know, like sanctification and those sorts of things. So the, the law, first and foremost, it shows us what a good work is, mm-hmm. right? And that's something that we desperately need. Um, the, the other piece of that is that it acts like a guide uh, on our road to greater holiness, Right. And so it's like the bumpers that you find in the, the bowling alley, right. That kind of help you keep the ball in the lane. Um, and it's also a mirror that lets us see ourselves really clearly. Um, and so it, the law is the perfect reflection of the perfect character of a perfect God. And so I go to the law as a believer and see clearly who I am in light of God's perfect character, right? And that's the convicting power of the law that reminds me, yes, there's still so much sin uh, and this remnant that's within me, this old man that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7. Um, and yet it also, I love the way Luther put this. Martin Luther said that the same, that the law was once a stick that was used to drive us to Christ, and after we have come to Christ, it's the crutch that helps us walk with him. Hmm. And so I think that's a really good explanation of how the law functions, um, that there is this um, instructive aspect to it and teaching us what a good work is. There is this, this uh, supportive a- aspect to it where it acts as our guide. And there is a convicting aspect to it, even for the Christian, where it acts as a mirror that lets us see ourselves clearly. Yeah. But the thing that w- that gets lost, the thing that we lose sight of in this when we start talking about the law and sanctification, and all of these things, and the thing that has to be put front and center is that for the Christian, Christ is the mediator of the law. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for the believer, it's Christ who reveals God's holiness, and it's Christ who's an example of what holiness of life actually looks like. And so... Mm-hmm. 
if we are indeed, as scripture says that we are, when we are uh, new creations in Christ, right? That's the language that Paul uses, that this is the language of in Christ, right? Then we are united to Christ. Then because we are in Christ, we're in this union with him, then we are going to imitate Christ's holiness, right? And so Christ is set forth in the gospel as our pattern for holiness and as our example of holiness. And so one of the dangers that happens in this is that we start separating Christ from sanctification, right? And so one of the things that is erroneous that happens when you hear sanctification and holiness preached on in fundamental circles is it's like, okay, well, Christ is fine for justification, but you don't hear hard, you hear hardly anything about Christ in relation to sanctification, right? And well, no, Christ is at the center of all of these things. And, and we, if we decenter Christ from this discussion, nothing here is going to go right. Okay. And so that's where, I think some of the problems with legalism come in is actually because we have moved Christ out of the center of this conversation, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And so if we understand that Christ is the mediator of the law, that changes how we come to the law. Um, if, If the folks that are listening to this, I really, really, really highly recommend uh, a book um, called the marrow of modern divinity. It was published in the 17th century by a guy named Edward Fisher. And it deals with these problems of legalism and antinomianism. And it is a a absolute uh, soul nourishing and life saving work when it comes to dealing with uh, sanctification, legalism, antinomianism. And one of the things that that the author of that book uh one of the distinctions that he makes is the distinction between receiving the law from the hand of Christ and receiving the law from the hand of Moses. Right. And so Christ is the mediator of the law for the Christian, not Moses. And we want to be very, very clear about that because, and one of the things that grows out of that is that then that means that for the Christian, as we come to the law and we come to our obedience to it, we're obeying law from life, not for life. Right. So how does the Ten Commandments begin? The Ten Commandments are given to a redeemed people. The, the, the Ten Commandments begin with, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, and then goes into the commands. Right. And so the, the, the people of Israel were meant to obey from their redemption. Right. And so where we get it twisted is that we start obeying for new life. Well, no, the law can't justify you. It was never able to do that. That's the the wrong use of the law. Right. And so what we want to kind of and and I don't know, I'll, I'll turn this train in this direction at this point, right? So so if that's what if that's what's happening with the law, if Christ is the mediator of the law, if our obedience to the law comes from life then where do we get these problems of of legalism and Christian liberty, right? And so if I'm obeying the law from life, then doesn't that imply that, you know, my obedience should be perfect? Well, no, because I still have this remnant of sin with which I have to deal, right? I mean, that's that's Paul's statement in Romans chapter 7, a wretched man that I am, who shall save me from this body of death, right? And so there is this war that's going on with sin, and yet I have liberty in Christ, that ultimately it's the word and Christ that binds my conscience, not the pastor. And so you, if you come to me and you say, Hutch, I believe that this behavior, whatever that behavior may be, and search your favorite uh, hobby horse there, is sin, Then and that you need to repent of it and say, okay, well, you need to prove that to me from Scripture. Um, and I, and I want to make that really, like, that's my standard, right? And so... The Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 20, uh, deals with that when it comes to uh, binding the conscience. But what I would say, and that this needs to be at the center of the discussion when we talk about legalism in the fundamentalist movement, is we need to make sure what we're talking about when we talk about legalism, right? Because there are two ways to think of legalism, and they all run and hide behind the, well, we never said you had to keep the law for salvation. The last area that they really use as a bantering Mm -hmm. call is the subject of legalism. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, of course, we're, we're getting so used to hearing that word, and we understand it's so misdefined. And, and I want to go on record and say this. I've been an independent Baptist now for mm-hmm. 21 years. I have never in my 21 years heard an independent Baptist preacher preach a legalistic sermon. And here's why. I've never heard one say that in order to be saved, you trust Christ, and then you do such and so. Mm-hmm. That's right. And if you don't do such and so, you're not saved. Now, maybe you've heard one or been in, you know, I've if never. you have, I want to hear the clip. Yeah. I mean, let's call him out. Let's let's put his name out. That's we can right. do it on social media. Let's do it. But I'm afraid that that's not what you're hearing. No. Nope. Nope. What they're saying is New this, definition. is that if you preach after you get saved, that you should live by the book. Mm-hmm. You should have biblical standards, principles right. that rule your life. Then right. all of a sudden, you are the legalist. Now, here's where they cross the line. They are saying, after they've redefined legalism. Right, and they have. And they have. And they've said all these independent Baptists that preach these things are under that umbrella. Then they've started to flirt with getting on the edge of saying they're preaching another gospel. Mm-hmm. Now, let me caution you. i got you. an issue with that. Let me caution you right here. You are then telling everybody else to run from this group of people Mm -hmm. because the gospel they preach is illegitimate, and you can't get saved there. Wow. That's heresy. Yes, sir. And if you are personally, I'm just going to say this, if you are so uh, twisted and warped in your mind that, yes, what you've had to construct as an argument against these people you're against, you got more problems than we can talk about in a podcast. Isn't that bordering on blasphemy of the Holy Ghost? Well, I mean, here's the thing about it. All those people that the independent Baptists have been mm-hmm. reaching for decades now, right. you're telling me all those right. people are illegitimate in their in- conversion? Including wow. some of your moms and dads. Oh, not uh-huh. only your moms and dads, but I've listened to them sit there and tell how they got saved from most of That's them because of the same. ministry yes. of That's an independent right. Baptist church That's and pastor. Right. And most of them time, they'll blast it on a podcast, turn around and apologize later saying, I'm not totally against it. I've got help there. Well, what are you then besides confused? Mm -hmm. That's right. You see what I'm saying? A double-minded man. is unstable in all of his ways. You never get saved in, good enough to start your ministry in, good enough to be raised in, but now all of a sudden not good enough for you. Okay, well, mm, that's not the only kind of legalism there is, Jack. Um, So there is the legalism that's obedience to the law for life rather than from life, which we were talking about. Then there's another legalism there, and that's binding the conscience of the believer and infringing on his Christian liberty. So some of your listeners may be uh, somewhat shocked by this, but I'm a real old school Presbyterian. Uh, I belong in the Highlands of Scotland circa 1652. And so I still only and always sing the Psalms and nothing else in worship. And so, and I believe I can make a very strong case for that biblically, that the Psalms and the Psalms alone are are, are what is to be sung in worship. Here's the thing. My wife doesn't believe that. My wife never has believed that. And so because of that, there is a difference of of opinion between my wife and I about what we are to sing in church. Uh, I am not a member of a Presbyterian church in my city that holds to my convictions on that point. Uh, there, There is one relatively close by, but I'm not a member there. And so I'm a member where every Lord's Day, there are people that are singing uninspired hymns written by men, and I don't like it. Uh, But I'm a member there because I love that church and I love those pastors and I love those people. And my wife stands next to me and sings hymns that I don't feel like I can sing. But I have never once bound my wife's conscience on that point. Mm -hmm. I have never once gone to my wife and said, this is what I believe. I'm your husband. Obey me. Not once. And that's because I would be binding her conscience in a way that I am not comfortable doing. Right, And so what we see happen all too frequently in fundamentalist circles is that whatever Pastor Tony is wound up about this week becomes you know, the standard yeah. for what we're concerned about. Right, mm-hmm. This is now the new standard for holiness. Right, I remember people got very upset. Pastor Schwartz, at, at one, of, one of my child's weddings, there was people on the other side. They weren't on my side because even though they might, they, they might disagree with me, they know better than open their mouth. Amen. Well. Hallelujah. I said, what does your family think of you? They don't always, and I'm talking about extended, they don't always agree with, but they know better than even open their mouth. Amen. 
I want to tell you something. We had a situation where some people on the other, the other family that one of my kids was married into were fired up mad because, because my son, one of my sons when he was getting married said, he, he walked in and he told them beforehand, this ain't going to happen. And somebody from the other side of the family decided they were going to be smart. And they brought in champagne glasses and they brought in sparkling cider and we're going to simulate sin and we're going to have a toast. Just like the world does it with their booze. Well, what's wrong with that as long as it's not alcoholic? It's simulating sin. Y'all look at me like I'm some kind of a weirdo. Can I help you tonight? I'm weirder than what you know. Because God said we are to be a peculiar people. And I thank the Lord. Many people on board, and I don't see anyone or have anyone in mind, but there are some people in this room tonight, they're not on board at all. They think this kind of preaching is whacked out. That's why your kids and grandkids are going to hell in a handbasket tonight. Well, we shouldn't say that because someone else might. I'd rather say that to the people who are offensive to the truths of the word of God and have the rest of the people strengthened and the rest of the people know what we're doing is right. Though some may oppose it, we're going to stay the course and we're going to not let our kids go to the devil and we're going to make sure our grandkids turn out for God. Amen. Amen. Come on. By the way, the churches that this kind of preaching is accepted in that I'm in are in the midst of great revival. How about that? So you can only listen to uh, bluegrass gospel music. Right, 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 right. Well, no, now we've decided that the banjo is descended from an instrument in Africa that plays rhythmically and syncopatedly, and a syncopated beat is from the devil, so now you can only listen to bluegrass gospel if it doesn't have a banjo in it. No. Right, this becomes such a moving target. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I, I've been saying last last several episodes. The moving goalposts, you know, moving goalposts of Christianity of 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 holiness is is this week this is okay. Next week it's not. And right. I, I think a lot of that just stems. We talked about this in the last one we did. Uh, a lot of that just comes from there not being a very clear systemic uh, systematic theology in yes. uh, independent Baptist churches. There's no there's no like way to look and say, what do we truly believe outside of saying what the B, the A, the P, the T, the I, the S, and the T stand for in Baptist. Right. That's pretty much it. And uh, most people that I've talked to don't even know that. Maybe the pastors, but most churchgoers don't even know that unless they've been there a long time. Right. Um, and here's what we mean when I'm talking about liberty of conscience, right? This is Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 20. God alone is the Lord of the conscience. Uh, proof text there is Romans 14.4 and James 4.12, and has left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men, which are in anything contrary to his word, or that are in addition to it in matters of faith or worship. And then there's a whole string of uh, proof texts that this is drawn for. So if you guys want to read those, you can, you can find the Westminster Confession of Faith online. And so what is what really is legalism? Well, the problem of legalism is that you've separated the law of God from the purpose of God, from the person of God. And here's the thing, antinomianism does the same thing. Legalism and antinomianism are identical twins birthed out of the same problem. This birthed out of a, a terrible, horrible, awful view of God. Um, so the, your antinomian is the, the idea of separating uh, the law of God from the person of God. Is that The antinomian is against the law. Right, and that's what everybody goes to when they talk about antinomianism. Anti against namos law. Well, if only it was that easy, because uh, you have various strains of antinomianism, right? I mean, you've got a a doctrinal strand of that. Um, but if we're if we really want to kind of narrow it down, like legalism overemphasizes the law, and it neglects the person of Christ. Right. Antinomianism overemphasizes the person of Christ and neglects the law. And so with the antinomian, with the outright hardcore antinomian, what you get is this sort of, well, hey, I love to sin. God loves to forgive sin. This is a really great deal for me. Right. Um, and, and, and that's not the case. No. Um, and so you have theologians that will teach, the worst of them that will teach that the law of God is completely nullified for the believer, Right. Uh, that's the, the outright theological um, antinomian. And then you've got your doctrinal antinomians, and they tend to, to go in a different direction. They'll deny that there's a threefold distinction of the law, which is what we usually talk about in the Reformed world, that the law mm -hmm. is divided into uh, 
that, that there's a moral law, civil law, and ceremonial law. And they'll say, well, the Bible doesn't you know, make those distinctions, to which I would say, well, yeah, actually it does. And we're not saying that distinguishing between those is easy, right? There, there are ceremonial laws that have moral aspects to them. And so we're not saying that this is an easy thing to, to parse, but we are saying that these are three legitimate categories that are revealed in the text of Scripture. Um, and then you have a, a kind of practical or experiential strand of antinomianism. And that's the extreme right? That's the other side of the coin. And what you see happen is a lot of folks leave fundamentalism and then the pendulum swings to antinomianism, right? And that's how you wind up with um, kind of the the meme of the, oh, they're out there living like the world and doing all these things. Well, well, no. What happened is, is you kept them pinned down so hard so long that when they got free of you, they swung to the other extreme. And let's be clear, that's understandable, I'm not saying I agree with it, especially not doctrinal antinomianism, mm. uh, but I certainly understand it because it happened to me. Right, that that was my experience of leaving fundamentalism was that I swung hard in the antinomian direction, and it was years before I was able to kind of find a biblical balance again in that and be able to say, okay, yeah, here's here's where I want to go or where I want to navigate. Um, And what the practical side of this does is that it ignores the transformative power of the gospel of free grace in Christ. So here's the issue. The solution to both of these problems, like legalism and antinomianism, is Jesus. Yeah. And and that's why when I talk about this, I keep saying we've got to put Christ at the center of this discussion, right? Because it's our union with Christ that's at the center of all of this. And if Christ isn't central in the way that you preach holiness, you're going to wind up with what you get in fundamentalism. Right. How did we get here? I can tell you exactly how we got here. You stopped preaching Christ. That's how you got here. You started preaching your opinions. You took Christ out of the center of the conversation. And then you started ranting and railing about whatever it is that upset you today. Right. So uh, women have the long hair, have to have long hair. Right. And now they can't have braided hair. Well, now they can't have braided hair as long as uh, now they can't have braided hair, but they can't have a red ribbon in it because the color red sinful. Right. Like, right. where does this stop? Yeah. Well, I can tell you where it stops. Put Christ back into the conversation. You'd be shocked at how easy this stuff is to get worked out. Yeah. So I'm going to stop ranting about that for right <laughs> now. Um, but this, this stuff makes me really upset. Yeah, because I see the absolute destruction that it leaves in people's lives. Right, I see it regularly. Yeah, because you're trying to do something that you weren't built to do. Yeah, you're trying to do something that you have no power to do. Yeah, and so and so, what do we say? Uh, we obey, 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 and this is all done in our own power, and this is all done apart from a dependence on the Holy Spirit, and this is all done apart from the recognition that Christ has indeed purchased that holiness for us, that He has provided the Spirit to apply that holiness to us, that He is the standard of holiness, and that He is the example of holiness, and what we wind up doing is just putting our shoulders down, working ourselves to death, and then you wonder why. Your, your people are just unloving, why they are extraordinarily judgmental, why it is that if I were to walk into to your church with the blue jeans that I'm wearing right now that have got, you know, holes in the knees, uh, I would get looked at sideways. Somebody might ask me to leave, in fact, um, which I have seen happen in fundamentalist churches, right? right. You, you got there because you cared more about somebody's opinion than you did about Jesus. That's how you got there. Right. And, and you're destroying people's lives by doing this. And then I've got to be the guy that comes in and, and, and helps pick up the pieces in 10 or 20 years. Right. Right? And that's, and, and the, and the horrible thing to me, Eric, is that the same guys that are doing this are the guys that are abusing little kids. Yeah. Right. Right. So not only are you weighing these people down with an extraordinary burden that they already have a hard time bearing, right? Now you use that as a tool to sneak in the side door and start abusing them physically or sexually or emotionally or mentally. And you use scripture to do it, you absolute piece of garbage. Mm. Like, what is this is mind-boggling to me. And it's amazing how much of it comes back to this. 
It's amazing how much of it comes back to legalism and Christ not being at the center of this conversation. Right. I think you can trace almost all of it there. Right. Well, when you have the when you have the vacuum that's left, when you take Christ out of it, you have to replace it with something. And it's right. going to be in most cases, it's going to be the pastor, the leadership. Yeah. It's going to be and at that point, who's to tell them no? Because they put themselves in that position. So yeah. to say no to them is to say no to God Himself. That is that is right. the structure in these environments. Yeah, and 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 we were going to talk about pastoral authority, and I'm sorry that we can't do that tonight, but that is such a black hole. Right. That I, I'm trying to do research on that for this episode, and there's almost nothing out there that that I can find that's that's as clear as I would like it to be. Um, but I will say this: I will say this as a guy who has been to seminary. I'll say this as a guy who's under the care of his Presbyterian is in the process of seeking licensure and ordination. When it comes to pastoral authority, we need to be really clear. Uh, about what the pastor's job is, right? What his job description really is. And if we can get some of that down straight, then I think that a lot of these problems for the people sitting in the pew, that maybe they'll get the courage to say, hang on a second, pastor, that's not your job, right? That's, that's Jesus's job. That one's not on you. Right. Um, and, I, I hadn't planned on this, so just kind of work with me. Um, but I will I will go to a, a specific passage of Scripture. Um, it's um, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. Um, and I'm, I'm using the, the King James Version uh, for, for now. Um, chapter 4 verses, I think it's 1 through 5. Is that right? Yeah, 1 through 5. Uh, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be urgent in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts they shall heap up to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. Um, verse 2 is the central part of that text for the pastor's job. right? So if the, the, the pastor's central job, uh, the teaching elder, is teaching. It is proclaiming the word. That's what Paul's driving at when he says for him to preach the word in verse 2. That's the central thing that, that the pastor is called to do. But what's intriguing is the, the manner that's given in uh, verse two um, where it says that he is to do this uh, with all long suffering, right? That's the modifier for the entire list that comes before it. He's to do all of these things with long suffering. If, if I were going to take that uh, over from, from Greek into English myself, it's uh, it's macrothemia. It, it would be the idea of complete patience and specifically. In fact, that particular term is used for patience in the face of provocation, right? That's the way it's used every time it appears in Scripture. Um, and so if, if, if you guys want to know more about that, you can send me an email. Um, but the idea is that this needs to be done with patience because you're dealing with people that are going to provoke you. You're dealing with a, a situation where they're going to follow their own desires. Like verse three, if you follow the logic of the text, verse three is the provocation, right? Because the time is going to come where they will not endure sound doctrine, right? And so fundamentalists preach this text and they talk about how the world is coming apart and they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't stand, pro, you know, the sound doctrine. And they use this as an opportunity to really beat people up from the pulpit where the text that they're preaching actually says that that's all the more reason for them to be more patient and more long suffering and more gentle and more loving. And yes, they may have to rebuke someone sharply. That's absolutely in the text. And I don't deny it. You may have to reprove someone. You may have to correct them, but it's done with complete patience. This needs to be a long process before you ever get there. And the, again, this is another one of those areas where they take a text and they flip it on its head, right? And so, yes, the day is coming when people are going to, you know, 
not endure sound doctrine. So now you have to be even more patient, pastor. Now you've got to work even harder. So this isn't about them and their sin in not enduring sound doctrine. It's about you, preacher, and your sin in not being completely patient. We've got the wrong audience in mind. Yeah, I think we certainly misrepresent the sanctification process, certainly misrepresent the gospel when it comes to, you know, the post salvation experience, if you want to, if you want to call it that. Um, But I, my concern, uh, and this was a concern that came up very early on. This was actually one of the first real theological concerns I had um, because I, I, you know, people know my story. I was very in line with the IFB. I was, I was bought in a hundred percent, didn't have any issues with anything. Um, Abuse is what made me first question like, oh, maybe this isn't a perfect uh, religious environment. And maybe there are things, you know, that baseline, like, Hey, maybe this isn't the be all end all. Maybe we're not God's, you know, chosen denomination. Mm. But when I started diving into theology, uh, How dare I, I, you? I, <laughs> when I started diving into theology and, and specifically uh, initially started diving into soteriology, uh, mm-hmm. diving into the gospel, diving into what is salvation, um, I went up and down rabbit trails all about, you know, uh, Lordship salvation and, and uh, easy believism, asking Jesus into your heart. I, I remember right. the first time uh, it was probably, I graduated in 2013, so it was probably 2000, early 2015 or, or end of 2014. And I remember sitting there and uh, I saw a quote, I think it may have been Matt Chandler. It was somebody, somebody was, that was like pretty big at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they had said, stop telling people to ask Jesus into their heart. Where you want to know that you're saved, but you just can't seem to figure it out. No matter how many times you pray the sinner's prayer, the doubts come back. You're always asking questions like, was I sorry enough? Was I, um, uh, did I repent enough? Was I surrendered enough? Did I understand enough about grace? Uh, did I understand the Trinity enough? Did I, I get the deity of Christ right? How do you know that you got it right? How do I, was I emotional enough in it? Well, one of the, on the other hand, I know that scripture tells us that there are a lot of people who have prayed a prayer to receive Jesus and consequently they think they're going to heaven because they prayed that prayer because somebody told them that if you pray this prayer, you'd be guaranteed to go to heaven whom the Bible says are tragically mistaken. And I remember sitting there and thinking, well, why would you do that? How are people going to get saved if they're not asking Jesus into their heart? And, right. and after st- in just a few seconds of me thinking that I realized like, I don't even understand biblical salvation. I don't understand what is it that, you know, cause, cause what, what was always taught to me was you admit you're a sinner you believe Jesus Christ died for you and you ABC, and then you confess Um, no, no talk of repentance, no talk of it. it, uh, They would argue that all of those things happen as a result of those things, which I think is accurate, but I I don't think it's well explained. Um, But the, but the way that people were led to led to Christ. And I say all this in quotation marks was, you know, bow your head, pray this, pray after me, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I'd be lost without you. I'm asking you now to enter my heart and, yeah, yeah. and save me. And it's like nobody, and, and this is where I, I'm going to be very direct on this. Nobody is saved by praying those words at all whatsoever uh, to, to yep. say, to just simply say, I believe Christ rose again. And I'm asking you to come into my heart is not a biblical means of salvation. And and that's incredibly important. And I think that's where so much of the misunderstanding of sanctification, we need to back up and take the legalist conversation and all of that and back up and say, how are we actually leading people to Christ in these camp meetings, in these, in these invitationals where it's heavy on manipulation, heavy on fear. And the goal is to just get people to, literally close your eyes, pray a prayer and say, okay, you've got literally in their words, you've got fire insurance. Um, That's such a dangerous, dangerous way to, to view the gospel. So um, I'll stop talking, but let's dive into easy believism. And uh, it's intriguing the way that you just described that because you talked about, you know, like uh, high pressure tactics. Hmm. Um, One of my, so again, you, you can't see it right now, but from directly behind me, all the way down this wall, there are about 10 bookshelves beyond the two that you see right here. Um, 
And one entire section of my library is I actually love collecting little books on personal evangelism <laughs> uh, for multiple reasons. Um, but one of my favorite one, uh, favorite ones is a book that was written by a salesman hmm. that was about applying the sales techniques like in the fifties to personal evangelism. And, and this is, and, and I, I can do this from, from, from memory verbatim. He's talking about, uh, He's talking about sharing the gospel with someone. He says, once you finish your presentation of the gospel, place your hand on their shoulder, say, pray with me and bow your head first. This creates intense psychological pressure. And with your hand on their shoulder, you will begin to feel their resistance crumble. Intense psychological pressure. How many converts have we made to intense psychological pressure? and not to Christ. No. I would argue a whole bunch. And, and that's that sort of high pressure sales tactic. And that does lead straight into this easy believism, fire insurance nonsense. Right. And so there, there are kind of two ways to think about easy believism. Uh, the, the first way of thinking about easy, believe, easy believism would be that it's, um, it would say that all that is necessary for salvation is a intellectual acknowledgement of Christ's saving work and a verbal appeal for salvation. That's a pretty good definition. Uh, in some older writers, uh, you'll find it used by folks that are opposed to the Protestant Reformation as a criticism of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, uh, in Christ alone, where no works are necessary for justification. So we would reject that as error. That's, that's the, that, that's the Romanist mm. error. Um, and yes, I realize that that's probably not going to make some of your listeners happy. And so feel free to send your unhappy emails to me and not Eric. <laughs> um, but the, the first one is an error. The idea that all that's necessary for salvation is an intellectual acknowledgement of Christ's saving work, plus a verbal uh, acknowledgement uh, or a verbal appeal for salvation. That's easy believism by definition. That's that's a, a significant doctrinal error, um, and, and on multiple levels. Um, so we could go to some passages of scripture there, uh, like Acts chapter sixteen verse thirty one, or Romans three twenty eight, or Galatians two sixteen. Um, but but here's here's the nub of it for me is that reduces faith to nothing more than assent, and and that's the problem. Um, salvation isn't just an intellectual agreement with a series of propositions with a verbal declaration that Christ is Savior tagged on the end of it. Um, the, the historic Protestant definition of faith is that faith is notitia, it's knowledge, uh, it's assentia, ascension, right? or I'm sorry, assent, like agreement, and then finally it's fiducia, it's trust. Right. And so what you get when you get this ABC, pray this prayer after me is, you know, do you admit that you're a sinner? Yes. Proposition one. Do you believe that Christ died for your sins? OK, that's an intellectual acknowledgement. Right. Yes. Confess. Right. Now you're in. OK, that's the definition of easy believism right there. Right? That's exactly the kind of error that, that we need to warn against. And actually what that leads to is the carnal Christian error. And once you follow that stream all the way down, that leads to this idea that, you know, oh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm saved. I, I was nine years old and I walked the aisle when Brother Jamie was preaching at the you know, Blessed Hope Independent Fundamental Full Gospel Pentecostal Holiness Assembly and Street Preacher Fighting Academy. And, you know, because I prayed the prayer that preacher Jamie told me to pray, I'm good. It doesn't matter that I beat my wife. It doesn't matter that, you know, my, my children are, are, you know, starving to death in the corner. I pray to prayer and I can live however I want. And, and how did, and, and that's where this easy believism ultimately ends. Um, so, so what's the, what's the right side of that? Well, here's the first thing. Um, this idea that if you can get somebody to pray this prayer that you give them, 
right? Like you're like you're just feeding quarters into a machine and making the words come out, right? Um, uh, you know, I admit that I'm a sinner. Jesus, this, Jesus, that, whatever. Um, and I don't mean that sacrilegiously, but the idea that that you can just give someone the words that they need to pray and and that they're good. This may be the most controversial thing I will ever say on your podcast. That's witchcraft. That's exactly what that is. That is pure witchcraft. Because that's the idea that if you say the exact, exactly the right words, and that if you put that incantation together in exactly the right order, now you're the one who gets to control God and God has to do what you want. That's the definition of witchcraft biblically. It's the idea that if you just say all the right things, then God has to do what you want him to do. So we need to dump that idea. That needs to get thrown out the window yesterday. In, in, in previous eras, what we would say is just let them pray it out. Right? And so uh, there's... Like a, you need to walk an old-fashioned aisle to an old-fashioned altar. Uh, really, an old-fashioned aisle to an old-fashioned altar, like Charles Grandison Finney only started doing in the 19th century, that's old-fashioned, right? For, in, in fact, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was completely opposed to that practice and the use of what was called the anxious bench at the time. So it, this, is, this is not uh, a, a rabbit trail. So when you were in the IFB, um, did you guys have the rule like we did in the church where I grew up where no one sat on the front row? Like you couldn't sit on the front pew. Yeah. Everybody, the, everybody had to sit the second pew back. No, but nobody did, but I don't know if it was a rule or not. Yeah. Okay. So th- that means that it had been a practice there at some point uh, historically, and it had been people had forgotten why they did that. That's what was called the anxious bench. And mm-hmm. so in the old days in the second great awakening in the, the early 1800s, if somebody was at a series of revival meetings and they came under extraordinary conviction of sin when Charles Finney or those like him were preaching, they would come sit on the very first pew. That was the anxious bench. Mm. And that's how the pastor knew who to invite into the interview room after the service to get them saved. Mm. Right. And so that, that was, that's where that practice comes from. So that's why nobody sits on the front pew. Um, so this, you know, altar call, anxious bench, pray after me, all of that is manipulation is what it comes down to. Um, because, you know, if you don't go forward, if somebody doesn't go forward, we're going to have to sing, you know, the, the 915th verse of just as I am mm-hmm. again. Um, and we're going to have to go through the previous 914 to get there. And we all just want to go home. Right. Um, and so that's, that's the complex that easy, easy believism is nested in. Okay, so let's, let's, let's take that complex apart. Okay, let's start mm-hmm. here. Um, the gospel is this, that mankind was created perfect and upright, and that he fell from that perfect and upright position. And that everything from that point forward has been the the world going sideways. And that what is desperately needed by humanity is a second Adam who can undo all of the things that the first Adam jacked up, right? Uh, Who can obey God's word perfectly and who is also able to pay the penalty that we should pay for the sin that we've committed. And we find that in the promised Messiah, uh, who's first promised in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman is going to come who will tread on the head of the snake and, and, and who will go to war with the snake and its seed. And that person has come and that by receiving and resting on Christ and Christ alone for salvation, you have been united to him. And so in a very profound sense, uh, Christ has already carried your human nature because Christ took on a human nature in his incarnation into heaven at the right hand of God, the father almighty. And so for the Christian, our assurance that God will accept, accept us and all of our fallen humanness is because the humanness of Christ is already in heaven at God's right hand. And so Christ is the central human 
the central person, let me say it that way, the central person in all of history, because he is a divine person and a human person, and those two things are held together in one. And so the gospel is that this person came and perfectly paid the penalty of your sin, and that by receiving him as your savior, savior right, which is, uh, this is the acknowledgement piece of it, right? This is the, the, uh, the noticia. I understand that this is who this person is, right? I know who Christ is. He is the, 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 the appointed redeemer for God's people, uh, a sense, a And I assent to the fact that I am indeed one of those people that needs a savior, right? And now the receiving him, that's the trust, the faith part, right? And so I am resting upon him and him alone for salvation. I've cast away any hope that any salvation will be found through anything I'm going to do right? Uh, I know my own nature. I know that I'm going to be really good at bootstrapping something for about a second and a half, right? And so if it's left to me, uh, I'm done, right? And so th when we proclaim that, what we're saying is that Christ here is dead for all of those who will receive and rest upon him, and that he has been resurrected for all of those who will receive and rest upon him. And he has ascended to the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, where he is now seated, ever making intercession for his people, for those who have been united to him by faith, who have received and rested upon him. And that's it. I don't need to manipulate you now. I don't need to, you know, like, okay, Brother Jimmy, come over here and you just, uh, you know, play the keyboards, right? And, and we'll get the fog machine going right? Like at, at Stephen Furtick's church, or I don't need to say, all right, sister Sarah, come over here and get on the piano. And we're going to play just as I am for the next hour and a half until somebody breaks down and finally walks the aisle. So we can all go and get our plate of, you know, fried chicken and collard greens. I don't need to do any of that. I've proclaimed the gospel. And in doing so, I have pointed you to the Lord Jesus Christ and said, there is Christ. There is the Savior that you need. Receive and rest upon him because he's the perfect for Savior for all of sinners. And then I can go home and lay my pillow on my head at night and sleep just fine because Christ has been proclaimed. You have been pointed to him. I don't need to manipulate you. And I can believe that the gospel is really powerful enough to change people and that I don't need to add all of that other nonsense. Right. The gospel genuinely is enough. I don't need to give you a prayer to pray. I don't need to put my hand on your shoulder and feel your psychological resistance crumble. I don't need to do any of that. No. Hmm? Well, and, and there's, there's two points there. Uh, am I cutting off? No, no. Okay, I'm just, okay. <laughs> I didn't know you were like frozen. I was like, uh, but uh, no, and th there's two things there that I think that we, that we just haven't touched on that I think are important to this. And one of those things um, and, and part, I mean, part of this, goes back to the nature thing but when you when you get to the concept of of sin you get to the concept of of salvation one thing that i never really understood was um you know the idea the idea when i get into i may let me reword this but when you get when you get into sanctification when you get into mm -hmm. that topic and you talk about living in accordance with who you are and in your in your position right. um mm -hmm. one thing that i never really truly understood the gravity of was Adam's fall. And, and mm -hmm. when you get into the conversation of federal headship and, and we don't as Americans, we don't ever think about it in the terminology of that time, but essentially Adam falling, he, he represented us as the figure that represented all of mankind. And so when he right. fell, it's the, it's the, the, the pithy saying that everyone says is um, you're not, you, you don't sin you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a, sinner. you're a sinner. And right. and so we're under judgment because of Adam's sin. Adam's sin right. represented all of mankind. When you get saved, Christ represents you. And so yes. you you get all of his righteousness. That's the imputation and all the conversation around that. Right. Um, yes, so, the, so the two Adams theology, uh, you find it in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. Yeah. And it's it's one of those things where when you understand that you you understand it in a term of nature, someone who is a a, a son of Adam, the first Adam, is not going to be able to live up to the performance that you want them to mm -hmm. under that nature. I, they, they can't, and even if they could, it would be of no benefit to them because they don't bear like the federal head is what they're being right. judged by. When they yeah. accept Christ, 
they can live in, in fulfillment with that. And it is to their benefit, but not because of their works, but because of Christ's works for them. Right. Um, so that, that understanding there alone, um, right. I think is going to change a lot of how you view both justification, justification and, and sanctification. sanctification. Yeah. It's so it's, it's a question of which Adam you're united to, right. Right. Are you right. united, are you united to the old Adam or the new Adam first Adam right. or second Adam, or to, or to put it another way um, you could come at it and say that it, Every single person is related to God by way of covenant. Hmm. The only question is whether you're a covenant breaker or a covenant keeper. Right. right. And so in Adam, we are all covenant breakers. Right. Right. But in Christ and our union with him, we are then united to the one who kept the covenant. Right. And, and that's the central piece of it. And so, you know, when we're talking about justification, when we're talking about sanctification, when we're talking about legalism, all of this comes back to the person of Christ mm -hmm. and what flows out of that, which is his work. And so you can't separate the two. You have to have them both. Right. But what we've done, because we, because we think that we can do it better, really, is what it comes down to, is we've had to make a show out of this, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it. And okay, so now we've got to add the long drawn out altar calls. And now we've got to add all of this pressure. And now I've got to tell you the exact words that you should say uh, in order to be saved, which that's that's a weird practice on, on multiple levels. Um, because what does that say about the amount of authority that I have? Right. And, that, and it's that completely I'm, extra biblical. Right. Well, well, and that I'm the only one who knows the secret words you have to say. Yeah. Right. So how much authority does that vest in me? that I've got the secret knowledge of the special words hmm. um, that you have to pray what I tell you to pray. Right. Um, we've, we've done all of this when all we need is a very basic, very simple explanation of man's fall in Adam, his ruin in Adam and his redemption and restoration in Christ. I don't need all the rest of it. Right. right. If, and, and that's where all of this has gone so wrong. Um, I think that, and this is going to maybe unfair uh, to, to some folks in the fundamentalist camp, but I think largely speaking and praying with a very broad brush and recognizing that there are lots of exceptions, um, it would be really helpful if Christ went back to the center of fundamentalism. Hmm. Um, because I don't think, I don't think he's been at the center of fundamentalist preaching for at least 40 years. Um, uh, yeah. Maybe longer than that, but at least that long, at least 40, um, at least since I was born. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, um, that's a strong point. And I, I, the, the other thing I wanted to, wanted to mention as well, um, was the, the conversation around, um, you know, I, I don't want to dive too heavily into reformed theology. Cause I think, I think all of this, even without agreeing with, you know, uh, you could say Calvinistic theology right. you could affirm everything that we just said so right. yeah. so so i'm not saying that by any means that you have to be a calvinist to be a, a christian or a believer or anything like that but i will say no, this I. I will say for preachers and for pastors and this is a basic continuation of what you were saying earlier uh understanding the nature of how faith is given um and, and understanding the nature of of um I mean, what, what you could call, um, you know, Calvinistic doctrine under, under understanding the way that salvation functions and the way that, that faith is a gift as much as grace is. Um, I think mm -hmm. it takes a lot of weight off the pastor, off of the, the preacher to persuade and convince. Um, yeah. cause here's the thing again, and, and this ties into this, why I brought up federal headship and, and, you know, you could say fallen state, someone in total depravity, someone who is lost cannot be persuaded to act against their nature. And so yeah. as just as much as grace is a free gift given to all those who would believe faith is also a gift given. And, and when yes. you look at, we love to talk about John three sixteen, but if you look at the beginning of that passage, it's a very interesting conversation uh, between, between Christ and this religious leader trying to say like, you need to be born again. And him, even with all this religious knowledge, doesn't understand it doesn't, and hasn't been enlightened to understand the words Christ is saying. Yeah. Uh, Christ starts talking about, you know, uh, about the wind talking about, and there's this very interesting conversation where Christ is talking very clearly in his language and it's being heard in a totally different 
yes. on state and it's being heard and saying, well, what do I practically do? How and, can a and, man enter into the womb a second time? Right, right. And, yeah. and so, so when you, when you're standing in a pulpit and it's on you to say, I need to persuade everyone here, it's on me, you know, the, 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 the sentence has been used from pulpits. Their blood is on your hand. If you don't, if you don't say it the right way, if you don't do it this way, if you don't, that is so much weight, so much pressure, and it's it's completely unachievable. There's no way to right. persuade someone to act against their best, you know, their their best interest, their will, what they perceive to be the right, right. path for them. It has There's, to be a gift of God. Like it has to be right. the Holy Spirit opening their heart so they can accept salvation. And yeah, that's the, a controversial point. Yeah, you you can't ask someone to act in a way that's contrary to their nature. Right. Right. So when my dog goes outside and pees on the neighbor's car tires, I don't get mad at my dog for being a dog. Yeah. Right. It's what a dog does. Um, in the same way that like, yes, I can be heartbroken about someone's sin, but I'm also not surprised by it. Right. Right. And, and like, yeah, sorry. That's just not shocking to me. Um, after all, I'm a former soldier. Trust me, you'd have to go a long way to shock me. Um, but by the same token, we want, we want to be really clear and, and hold these two things in, in the appropriate tensions that yes, the, the pastoral office is a high calling and yes, pastors are going to be judged with a harsher judge. But at the end of the night, my job is, is nothing more than proclaiming the message. Right. And, and so do I want to do that in a way that is persuasive? Sure. And do I want to present that to you in a way that's, that's easy to understand Yes, absolutely. But at the end of the night, it's God who's doing the work there. And so that's, that's what I have like, and, and some, and some Sundays after I preach, this has been the only thing that's kept me from just ripping my hair out is that clearly the Lord was in it somehow. Um, and, and that, you know, what I said in God's providence was what he wanted me to say. And so the, the, the hope and, and the security there is that my job is simply to proclaim the message. It's the job of the Holy Spirit to apply it and convert. Mm -hmm. I can't make anybody a Christian. And, and God help anyone that I make a Christian, because if I do, then they're damned. And that's why I hate the term soul winner. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I despise the terminology of soul winning or be a great soul winner, because it puts all of the, all of the credit on the, soul, on the shoulders of the right. person who's doing the witnessing. Um, yeah. Years ago, when I was working in a restaurant business, I had an independent fundamental Baptist preacher that uh, would come in and eat lunch on occasion. And he had been out street preaching in the little town that I lived in. Um, and he was standing in line to order his food at this little Greek place that I worked. And somebody asked him, you know, how did it go out there? And he was he was standing right in front of me, like he was getting ready to order. And so there was no one between me and him. So there's no way he couldn't have heard me say this. Um, <laughs> somebody was walking by and asked him like, so how did it go while you're preaching out there? And he said, Oh, it went great. I saved 15 of them today. And before I could stop myself, it just popped out and I went, well, brother, if you save them, they're going straight to hell. <laughs> and the look on his face of utter shock, that I guess that somebody would dare to talk back to him, much less to say that was worth the, the price of admission, you might say. Um, but that really is the point, right? I mean, like mm -hmm. Jesus saves them. I don't. Right. Right. And, and, and then you've got that really stupid, you know, the, you, you catch them, I'll clean them theology, <laughs> right? Like it's the pastor's job, but it, right. like, I don't even catch them. Right. You know, Jesus does that too. Yeah. Right. I'm just the messenger. Don't get it twisted. Right. So no, that's awesome. Yeah, no, I th I think uh, I I think that's a good spot to to pause for now. I mean, we've got so much. Uh, that's 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 three out of uh, three out of six that we want to cover, and we could probably have spent uh, another two three hours diving into those uh, those initial three or days or uh, or weeks or or months probably discussing this. Yeah. Um, but um, but I, I really do appreciate you diving into this, and I guess this is our official teaser for uh, part three. <laughs> at some Which point God willing will come faster than part two did hopefully uh, but i like the suspense i think it uh i think it helped the popularity of the first one people having to wait and rewatch. and but no i hopefully part three right. will be sooner um but i i do appreciate you coming on and, and everybody listening to this i i swear you had better go over and subscribe to the true presbyterian after listening to this 
If you don't, I'm going to personally come after you. I, I don't know where you live. I don't know who you are, but I will find you at some point and uh, force you to sp- subscribe. Uh, but yeah, go check it out. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on. We we do some of the craziest, longest, most intense episodes. I know, especially for your end, uh, being the uh, being the expert over here, our uh, resident Presbyterian uh, I'm, expert. So I, I'm not an expert in anything. I'm just, uh, hopefully the best I can do is point folks in the right direction. And I will say, if you guys do come and subscribe to the podcast, just be forewarned, uh, a, I will talk to anyone B you might not like me very much. Uh, and C you might not like all the topics that I cover, but I will talk to anyone. And so if, if that's a problem for you too bad. Yeah. So, well- they listen to this, so I don't think it will be, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for coming on and uh, look forward to part three, hopefully not a uh, half a year from now. So well, thanks again, Eric. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.